morning. I'll morning. tell a little story first because we have seen a bit of him. I knew up in Fort Collins when she was uh, there with the, at the same time we were there, but we had the, I had, uh, when I was in residency, had a patient I would see once a month in a nursing home. I actually had about 12, but only one of them could talk. And so I would talk with her at great length. And that was Letha Fletcher, if you remember her. And people brought her to church. So I'd see her at the nursing home and I'd say hi to her at church and we'd greet one another and all that. And then toward the end of the three years, I told her I was having to leave. Right about then, in fact, 29 years ago today, my son Adam was born. And so uh, it was right at the end of our time there. We were moving about three months later. So I told her I would be moving <coughs> and would miss her. And, and I showed her that we had just had our third son. And she said, wow, you know, we have a family in church that's had their third little boy. She said, you know, their last name is Clothier too. <laughs> <laughs> What a connection. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> um, today's trivia question is what city was Jonah from? Then I will also accept what tribal area was he from? <coughs> and we'll also accept, because this will give you a clue to the answer, what king he served under, what king of Israel? Because it's in the Bible. It may not possibly be where you think it is this time, but that, um, those are pretty good. I think pretty good clues. And I appreciate very teaching last week. I see true form. He didn't show up today. <laughs> it always happens, you know? Yeah. And um, then we'll get started. So Adam was one of our two babies I got to deliver. And he's 29 today, still alive. Yep. He made her. Yes, Beth Heifer? Heifer? Gath Heifer. Gath Heifer, I missed anything. Yeah, Gath Heifer. And you found that in 2 Kings? Second Kings. And Joshua? Okay. Let's look at, uh, since we trust the Jonah passage, Let's say 2 Kings, which is right after 1 Kings, and this is 15, probably, <coughs> actually, no, 14, 14, 14, 25, so I'll go 14, 23, Gath Hefer. In the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria, Samaria and he reigned 41 years. So this was Jeroboam the second. This was not the Jeroboam that split the kingdom. This is Jeroboam the second. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam son Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. Jeroboam was also long dead, but he had led Israel astray. He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Sea of the Arabah in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. So, and that's, if we get down to verse 28, as for the other events he did, all his military achievements, whatever, in 41 years, Jeroboam rested with his fathers, verse 29, and Zechariah's son succeeded in his king. So for 41 years, the most prominent feature was that Jonah got mentioned. And I think that speaks by him. So this, this was, Jonah was born in Gath Hefer, in the region of Zebulun. And so the only reason I brought that up today is a little trivia question, which we could re-ask here in a second. Uh, but the, the reason I brought it up was that apparently Gath Hefer is the closest city to Nazareth in uh, the uh, area of Israel. So hmm. Jesus probably knew some people from Gath Hefer, if it was still called that then. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to me that he was compared to Jonah in terms of three days in the tomb, three days in the great fish, and being raised up from that. And it's, uh, you know, I think nothing happens by coincidence in Scripture. So it's kind of interesting. Matthew 5. Last time, I think we got all the way down to now, verse 1. 
And did we go further than that? I think we got to the merciful. Last week we didn't do any yeah. of that. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to verse six. I think, yeah, we did meek, meekness, meekness is Two not weeks weakness. Ago. Yeah. And we did that. I remember as if I was here. So this is week 11 and uh, of our study of Matthew. So we're going to make progress today because I won't be distracted at all <laughs> by, yeah, granddaughters. Wow. Hey, wife. Nice. Very good. Daughter. Good. This is great. All right. So we'll be, uh, we'll be at Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I think that's pretty straightforward. I don't really need to go into that further. They, if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you'll be filled. The only thing that probably comes up from that is what is righteousness? And righteousness is to be God-likeness, is to, uh, to have a goal of God-likeness. So if you want to be righteous, in our world it might be, you know, a little bit different. It's almost like the term awesome has changed. That People say, you know, oh, I went to the store and I found they weren't out of toilet paper. Oh, that's awesome. Well, that's not really what awesome was meant to mean. Awesome was to mean as if in the presence of God, in the greatness of his spirit. And so with righteousness, it's not just being righteous, like being cool, like from the 60s, 70s, some of you may remember that or things like that, but it is to pursue God-likeness. So if you pursue God-likeness, you'll be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. Pretty straightforward too. Mercy is one of those challenges for us, I think, because we don't think a lot about mercy. We think a lot about revenge. And I think uh, it's clear that God has told us revenge is his, not ours, and that we're not to judge. And to me, that's one of the greatest freedoms that God can give us to be not judges, but to trust that God's a judge. God can discern the heart and the soul, and we don't have to. We just simply need to be available to people to serve them, teach them, uh, pray for them, fellowship with uh, them, encourage them, host them. Um, you know, as we read, even angels may be present. And, you know, it, it's really an important thing to be merciful because we want to receive mercy. You don't want to be held accountable for everything you do and have said and whatever. And, of course, that gets to the blood of Christ, which is sufficient for all and that all uh, forgiveness available in Christ and we don't have to worry about each individual second moment uh, we need to pursue mercy blessed are the merciful for they'll be shown mercy blessed are the pure in heart for they'll see God so what about pure in heart anybody have a particular feeling is that thinking only the right thing is that doing only the right thing is that hmm. Having a heart of desire for godliness, like righteousness. And I would say that's the closest. I don't think he can really get down to pure in heart, like perfect, because we're not perfect except in the blood of Christ. And eventually, of course, Jesus himself will mention here in the Sermon on the Mount to be perfect like our Father in heaven. And we can't be perfect except through Christ. So we can be pure in heart. We can have the desire to do what's right for godliness, but we we cannot achieve that, but we can see God when we're pure in heart. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called sons of God. That's, I think, a big one for our era in life, too, because there's not a lot of peace in the world. If you look at just everything from a world viewpoint, from a local viewpoint, from disease, from poverty from cancer well that'd be qualified i guess as a disease the uh but from conflict you know we have a significant conflict going on in the world right now that we kind of forget maybe uh between ukraine and russia where apparently children are even being taken at this point out of ukraine and taken into russia for who knows what there was an interesting article about three weeks ago about a a person who found out they were a child of the Nazi uh, medical experiment phase and babies and how that made them feel as opposed to being a member of their community which they were in and ironically were uh, living right at the border still uh, France and Germany uh, 
and you know, kind of a uh, uh, a juxtaposition between the old culture and the new culture. And it was an interesting thing to think about a tainted history where they were chosen because of their genetics to be alive by people. And of course that has its flaw to it. But peacemakers are called, will be called sons of God. How would that differ, you might ask, about they'll see God for the pure in heart or be called sons of God by peacemakers? And I would suggest this is all just part of the poetic form by Christ to teach about looking to the future of godliness, looking toward heaven, looking toward the kingdom of heaven most specifically, because he started with the phrase, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And remember back at chapter 417, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. So he was talking about having a perspective that was away from earth, different from those on earth, while on earth, but also the future of the uh, Christianity as we know it today, I believe. What thoughts on that? Any, any thoughts on that? Chandler, you have any thoughts on that? Yes, go ahead. I thought Chris Stewart did a great job this morning. Mm -hmm. Explain the Colossian phraseology. And, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> being in the kingdom, being of hope, being of faith. Yeah, definitely so. And, you know, these are things that were new concepts. That's another thing I think we need to really understand with the uh, Sermon on the Mount. This was early in the ministry of Jesus. It may not have been the first thing in the ministry of Jesus. You know, it's, according to how we read it, it feels like the first thing. And it was certainly probably in the first handful of months. So very early in the uh, ministry of Jesus, but he was just beginning to teach the people about who he was and who God is to them, to us, because this is all part of the new covenant coming, taking away from, or out of, maybe I shouldn't say away from, because it was in fulfillment of the law and the prophets that Jesus came. But not taking out of that, but showing the better way, the, the kingdom way, the kingdom of heaven way that Jesus wanted the people to understand. And of course, that is so much more a matter of the heart than of ritual. And I think that's uh, what he's speaking of in many of these phrases about being peacemakers, being sons of God. You may not see that peace immediately, but you'll see that peace with time. Yes? Norm, that's something I think about sometimes. We think that these people that actually got to be with Jesus and to see him on earth physically, uh -huh. that, that we don't get to do. We, I sometimes think, oh, I wish I'd have been one of those people that could have done that. Yeah. But then I think, you, you know, I think I probably have a better perspective than they did. They were disadvantaged. Uh -huh. They didn't know what happened later. Absolutely. He was trying to tell them what was going to happen to him. And all this that he's saying is really sort of a prediction of the future, the kingdom of God, the way it's going to be in yeah. the future. They didn't know that. We can look right. back and read it with that with those, with that knowledge of what has already happened. That Very interesting decide. point. Absolutely. So her comment, if you couldn't hear it on for the tape there, uh, the, was that we sometimes think it would have been a real blessing to be right there with Jesus, but we have the perspective of time I did the big picture, the view that Jesus died, rose, and uh, ascended into heaven, and um, you know all the things that we can put together now that must have been a bit of a mystery to them then. And I agree, and I think to some degree we talk about how we want to be like the first century church, and I'm not real sure we do. But if we wanted to be the first century church, we wouldn't for you know three quarters of many of those lifetimes wouldn't have had a gospel to read about the words of Jesus. We'd rely on, oh, I heard an evangelist say this. Well, I heard an evangelist say that. And, you know, we'd have sort of a, a different view on what we heard because now we have it written and we have other books or other letters written that we can sit around, scrutinize and, you know, kind of pick apart that can be good or bad too, because you know I think we all have our tendency to like some passages, not like some, for instance, it, it happens because we're human. But you're right, I think the perspective of time, you have to me, like for instance, when we're about to get to Jesus talking about fulfilling law and about murder uh, in your heart versus the actual murder, that was a very shocking teaching, I think, to the people. 
And they didn't really know yet who Jesus was. You know, they didn't even know who Jesus was after he died. They went off back to their um, fishing and, you know, back out away from the ministry, wondering what would happen. And then they realized that he had raised from the dead. So very, it's very hard, I think, to picture being an early individual being taught by the Son of God and suddenly putting all the pieces together. It, it takes some time. And that may be the lesson to us, too, that if we teach somebody about Christ, it may take them a little time to come around. It's, you know, we don't want to give up on somebody quickly. We don't want to necessarily feel like we failed if they don't immediately turn to Christ. Uh, but I think if we plant the seed, God gives that growth. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Boy, there goes the uh, tendency to want all these things. We like foreign spirit. We like those more, and we like to conserve being meat. We like, I hope, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. We would love to be merciful and pure in heart and a peacemaker. But all of a sudden, he throws in that little zinger. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So same general conclusion it's the kingdom of heaven but you know it, a definite foreshadowing i believe going up to uh the last supper of jesus when he was talking about if the world don't be surprised that the world hates you because they will hate you because they hate me and i think he knew very well the persecution that was coming even early in the ministry and you know the people with him i doubt had any real feeling of that whatsoever i I just would suspect not one of them sat around and said, you know, I think we're going to be dispersed around the world after Jesus probably uh, will be put to death in a horrible way, buried probably three days later, he'll raise up because I think he's going to teach us about the signs, Jonah. And, you know, all these things, you can't put all that together early, but I can't help but think that must have been a little bit of a red flag if you're persecuted because of righteousness. But you sell the promise of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So, let's say about that for a minute. Assuming this was nearly all Jewish audience, which I think was probably true, he was teaching, you know, in the area of the uh, uh, Decapolis and the area around the Sea of Galilee, but I think it was largely a Jewish following that he had at this point. What was the primary reward for people in Judaism if they fulfilled the law and brought sacrifices every year, had Day of Atonement? Um, what did they look forward to? Acceptance by God. Yeah. They were, they were doing what he said to do. Right, so they look for acceptance by God. Was there much of a perspective on the soul in terms of eternity? Now, I don't think they really understood eternity. You know, I think that's, that's another challenge to them. It was absolutely for forgiveness and acceptance by God and being able to come into his presence at the temple to be qualified as, you know, frankly, a good Jew. If you, you know, followed the laws and got to the Day of Atonement each year, you'd have the scapegoat released for your sins, you'd have the sacrifice of the Holy, uh, or the High Priest going into the Holy of Holies. But there wasn't a perspective, I believe, about, well, what's going to happen when I die? Maybe when I die, I'd be buried in the land of Israel. And that might be their uh, primary perspective. And maybe on the property of forefathers because they were guaranteed an inheritance in Israel. But there wasn't a lot of talk about heaven. So I think it's interesting. Well, he said, rejoice and be glad because grace is your reward in heaven for the same way they persecuted the prophets here before you. So the only connection I could think of the Jews making very directly there would be that Elijah was pulled up into heaven by God in the presence of the whirlwind and the fiery chariot and the witness of Elisha holding his cloak and taking his cloak because he was going to take on the ministry. But way beyond that, it's really hard to think about, you know, did they talk about how David was in heaven? I don't really think so. So, you know, it's a, it's a very different perspective. 
And of course, you know, when we read about prophets being persecuted, I don't think that was probably something most of the people aspired to get to do. You know, get to be taken outside of a city and stoned or ostracized or forced out into the desert to be fed by ravens for 40 days. You know, it's those are not easy things Jesus is teaching. And I think a little bit of the perspective that we have is, oh, these are great. These are the Beatitudes. These are, these are joyousness uh, in written form. And they are. But I think we have to keep in perspective those last couple of phrases about being persecuted, being insulted, false things, uh, have been, false things said about us, and then realize that there's reward in heaven. So because of that, in the same way that persecuted the prophets here before you, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except be thrown out and trampled by men. You're the light of the world, city on the hill can't be hidden. Neither the people, neither do people, excuse me, light a lamp and put it under a bowl. And so they put it on sand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So this is a pretty dramatic change from, you know, if you pursue God, you'll be blessed, blessed in the kingdom of heaven. If you pursue God and are blessed in the kingdom of heaven, you'll be persecuted. And then if you are persecuted, you need to hold steadfast with light or salt, salt first, and then light to be the salt that doesn't lose its saltiness and the light that provides life for people for guidance at night. And that's kind of an interesting perspective too because, you know, very practical. They would understand that. So what is salt that loses its saltiness? Why would salt not be salt? Why would sodium chloride not be sodium chloride? It's not a chemistry equation, but what do you think? Tatum, got any ideas? Not really. Okay. I'll try. So salt, in this time, would uh, be primarily from mining from the ground or from gathering around the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea famously full of enough salt that you can float it and whatever. And so the uh, Dead Sea, having a lot of salt, has probably what else if you gather it from the shore, but sand. And so if you dig up salt or you scrape salt from the edge of the Dead Sea, you're going to have impurities. We're pretty pretty blessed, I guess, is a fair term, that if you go buy salt, you pretty much guarantee it's not going to be half dirt. And if you, um, if you have half dirt and you use that, some form or another, to help prepare food or preserve food, at some point, the salt leaches out and does its thing as sodium chloride and the dirt is left behind. So this analogy of being the salt of the earth, but then losing its saltiness, being thrown out, and trampled by men would be that the dirt would be returned to the soil essentially as the salt was used. So I think from that perspective, it makes perfect sense as, uh, you know, we are impure, we are made purified through Christ and then what is not pure is thrown away. And that, that is a very fair spiritual description of that, I believe. And then the light, of course, you know, if everyone, it, when he mentions verse 15, uh, the light giving light to everyone in the house. Yeah, that was 15. Then, you know, keep in mind, much like we talked about how thieves can come in, or we will talk about, we haven't yet, um, but it's in the Sermon on the Mount, how thieves come into the house easily, was that the typical house was essentially mud walls, they usually would enter through the roof. That's why I think when the layman was brought to Jesus where he was teaching and they lowered him through the house, everybody wasn't panicked because, or lowered him through the roof, not through the house probably, unless they dropped him, I guess. But if they lowered him into the house, it wasn't a source of panic. It was simply the way of entry. And of course, in that case, they wanted to be in the presence of Jesus so they entered that way. So if you had mud walls and a room and then you could dig through those mud walls fairly easily, or dried mud, dirt, I guess is what that's defined as. You could dig through there and break in, which we'll read about here in a little bit. And you also could illuminate the entire house with one lamp. So that would be an analogy that might make a little better sense then than now when we have divided buildings. You know, if we have one light in this building, 
if you're not near it, you wouldn't end up seeing that light. But if you have one light in your household, because it's one room, then it makes sense. That's the analogy it is to be put up to where everyone can see it. Anything else on that? Anybody? Okay. So, <clears throat> do not think, verse 17, that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. That's why I almost accidentally said a little while ago. I have not come, Jesus says, to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is, is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you'll be certain, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So what do you think about that? All that passage. Well, wouldn't it be kind of a, a new, I mean, in context of what you said earlier, it would be all something like a whole new way of looking at things. They wouldn't even, mm -hmm. I mean, and I had never thought about that before. That's, that's kind of amazing to think about that. That's kind of like the lost now. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what I hear from people who are generally not believers, whether agnostic, atheist, believer in a false god, uh, just don't care, or just never have really been around somebody that they feel like is a Christian in a sense, you know, if they just have been raised in an environment without it. What I think they usually think is, how could you think that there's heaven? Or what could you look forward to um, if not success here on earth? And I always think, how could we not think of heaven and want success here on earth instead? Because the eternal view of uh, being in the presence of God is so much greater than anything you could achieve on earth. And everything on earth is transient, everything about heaven is permanent. So I think it takes though that leap of faith, which is of course belief in what you don't see, uh, because we know that's true. And I don't think humans, I, well, let me rephrase that. I think humans are born yearning for God. I think there's, uh, because we're created in the image of God, we want to fill that with God. Sometimes that's filled with Satan as the opposing party to God. But I think we have a spiritual view because we're uh, created in the present area in the uh, image of God. So I think there's a yearning, but I think people who have no idea who God is don't know that they have that yearning. They're just yearning for something. And so when we start looking at the, this perspective of adding the goal of heaven, I think it's really interesting that he throws in all of a sudden here, um, he's going to fulfill the word, it, everything um, will be accomplished. Anyone who breaks the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same be least in the kingdom of heaven. There's that kingdom of heaven phrase again. Uh, forever, and whoever practices and teaches these commands be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teaches the law, you'll certainly not enter, enter the kingdom of heaven. So he's talking in all this phraseology, but the real, the zinger to me much more so than the Pharisee talk is verse 18. I tell you the truth, I'm, until heaven and earth disappear. Um, and I think that would be very hard for them to picture. I, you know, we, we talk about Christ coming like a thief in the night and the earth being destroyed and people being called to him in heaven and, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, future hope tied into all that process. And I don't think they've talked much at all beyond just, Oh, you know, we got the Day of Atonement coming here soon. Or, I owe sacrifices, so I need to put together sacrifices for the sin I committed against my neighbor. Or, I wonder who's going to attack us next week. 
and what we'll do to get out of that attack. You know, and it's interesting that uh, God originally told them if they just obeyed his commands, Israel would be great. The land of milk and honey, no enemies, no difficulty in growing crops. Every seventh year they rest as a Sabbath year. Every 50th year they'd have the, they'd have the ju year of Jubilee uh, to uh, release those who were indentured or enslaved and to sort of start again in that local kingdom of heaven. But again, I don't think it talked about when the earth is gone or when, uh, obviously, they didn't know about the Son of God coming back. But uh, there's so much more hope in that than trying as a corporate nation to follow God's laws and rituals and uh, try to cope. I mean, that's, I don't know how else to put that, but I think it's interesting that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but he came to fulfill them. And so what was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets? That, what she meant to say was <laughs> the fulfillment of the law and the prophets was the ultimate sacrifice because the Lamb of sacrifice is Jesus and so when the Lamb of God was pit on the 10th day of Nisan, you know I talk about that a lot at Passover week in his third year of ministry and then sacrifice on the Passover the 14th day of Nisan, that blood that the Israelites would celebrate was to deliver them from their enemies was our blood once and for all to deliver us from the enemy and that fulfillment of the law and the prophets the law and the prophets involved sacrifice and blood sacrifice for sins and a perfect lamb to be brought at passover and jesus served that role as the perfect sacrifice and the blood of the lamb brought at passover which by the way since i've mentioned before passover can be on different days what year what day excuse me this year is passover Okay, we'll back up from what day is Easter? Ninth, ninth of April, yeah. Yeah, ninth of April is Easter Sunday, observed. The fifth of East, of Easter, yeah, fifth of April is Passover. So back that up a little bit. Let's see, that'd be the eighth Saturday, the seventh Friday, the sixth Thursday, the fifth. That's Wednesday the fifth. If we, as we've talked about, if Jesus were to come this year as the uh, sacrificial lamb, he would be crucified. That would be the 14th of Nisan. That'd be on Wednesday the 5th of April. And so that's why, because Passover is a different day each year, uh, that I think that Jesus was crucified on Thursday of Passover and raised three days later, not three weird days or impossible to define days but three days and three nights later as he talked about being in the tomb so that'd be thursday night friday night saturday night race sunday morning so anyway we observe easter on sunday every year because he, and you can even look at you know last time two weeks ago we talked about the piece of paper with the little blocks on it called the calendar if you look at that it'll say passover on the wednesday and it'll say easter observed on the Sunday because that's the day we observe as the uh, Sunday morning that Jesus rose, which I think is fine. I think that's appropriate, but I think it's uh, also fair to realize Passover is on a different day each year. All right, so the fulfillment of the law was Jesus coming, and of course here he didn't talk about as the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, he would be put to death and shed his blood for us at Passover, uh, but he didn't. So we know that because we have the rest of the story, which I think is very helpful. Verse 21. You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. Oh, before I mention this, I should mention that he did bring up the Pharisees. So this is the first real public um, mentioning of the Pharisees, I guess, being in opposition to Jesus. He said, because, well, not necessarily in opposition at this point, but he said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of law, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. And I believe the reason he mentioned that was because at that time, the Pharisees and the teachers of law felt like they had a grasp of scripture that could not be grasped by anyone else. 
So they felt like they had a monopoly on scripture and righteous pursuit. And uh, so he was beginning that confrontation by mentioning that to about them. You've heard that it was said to people long ago, don't murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says his brother Raka is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Boy, that's an interesting one too. Because there's not a lot of mention about hell in the Old Testament and in the Mosaic Law, is there? Start quoting all the passages about hell in the Old Testament. It's kind of hard to come by. Um, so, you know, this again was a pretty radical new teaching by Jesus. And the fact that going from the physical act to the intent of the heart was a huge swing in the way we pursue righteousness. So, in other words, if I've gone around hating everybody I meet, and which isn't true, by the way, um, and, you know, being, being an irritant to everybody I can think of and thinking they're all dumb, foolish, pitiful, you know, don't deserve to be on the earth, raka type of a mentality, and I haven't actually killed one of them, that doesn't make me innocent under this new law. This, the new law was the intent of the heart. And so if you think to yourself, boy, I'm angry and I kind of want this guy to suffer because I'm angry with him, that is where the sin occurs, the separation from the will of God. It is not the actual physical action. So that that was a big change too. And, you know, again, kind of a Pharisaic deal was you follow the letter of the law and you're fine. You, you know, you can walk your seven-eighths of a mile in different terms back then, um, on Sabbath day. But if you walk a little further, you've seen him. Well, in this case, it'd be, well, if you kind of sneak around, get under that wire and kind of go somewhere else, but nobody saw you anyway, then you've got to have the character, the realization that God knows what's going on to do what's right. And I want to finish this little section. Therefore, if you are offering your gift, verse 23, at the altar, and there remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while you're still with them on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I'll tell you the truth, you'll not get out until you pay the last penny. So we think of that as, you know, kind of lawsuits, kind of legal action. I would suggest, think about verse 9 of chapter 5. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called sons of God. Because I think the ultimate issue, if somebody has anger in their heart toward you, whom you have determined as an individual who wishes to pursue righteousness, you should no longer have anger in your heart toward them. And I find anger is usually a two-way street. There's usually a frustration each way. There's usually a desire to get the upper hand or revenge or whatever you want to call it. And I think it is the absolute blessing to be the peacemaker in that. Pray for that person, apologize, whatever is going on, try and make it right. Don't let it fester, don't let it become a bad abscess, it never goes away. Uh, it's just a, you know, it's one of those things that takes somebody to have the proper approach to make peace. And blessed are the peacemakers. And I think you know, ultimately, I feel like most of the complaints I get about anything, whether it's in the neighborhood, in, at work, here, wherever, most all the complaints I get are a lack of peace. It's somebody not being willing to be okay with somebody else being in the spot they're in. It's usually jealousy, pride, frustration, hatred, um, whatever it is, but it basically involves somebody's got to declare peace. And once that peace is declared, it may not be great. It may not be a perfect, you know, we'll spend all our time together the rest of our lives deal, but it doesn't have to be, I'm going to avoid you the rest of my life because I hate you. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about pursuing the peace with a brother like 
leaving your gift at the altar, and if you suddenly remember, oh, you know, there's something not spiritually right, let me make it right. That's what we're called to do. Thank you for paying such nice attention to the comments, and we'll pick up there at Lesson 12 next week.